Okay, hello everybody. I am Robin with Scaling Up. Um, my pronouns are she, her. Just wanna give you all a quick um, video image description for accessibility. Um, I am a biracial black femme. I have short, dark hair, kind of cut to one side. Right now I have it straightened. I'm wearing a pink-ish, a muted pink t-shirt with some um, really cool work phrases on it, like safety for everyone, health for everyone, accountability for everyone. I'm also wearing kind of this black and white peppered cardigan over it. And in the background, you can see my room with some shelvings and such. And I have dark gray walls um, and I'm wearing um, thick framed glasses. So I wanted to just let you all know kind of what I'm looking like in case you're not able to see me for any reason. So just wanted to let you know that. Um, and I'm really excited today to be talking with Emma, um, and I will, Emma, I'll let you introduce yourself in a, in a minute. I just want to do a couple of housekeeping items. Um, right now at this time, my closed captioning integration is not working properly, and I seem to forget to check on it until it's time to get on one of these webinars, and I'm like, dang it. Um, but I do place all of the webinars on YouTube, which will auto caption. Um, not the best to have auto captions, um, but it is you know what they have available on YouTube um, right now without us importing um, a, a script. So uh, you will all receive the replay um, later on today or tomorrow morning. Sometimes our, our tech sends things out at the, in the middle of the night. So, um, you will get the replay along with a really cool bonus um, for attending today or for watching the replay later if you couldn't attend live. And um, at the end, we will have a few minutes for Q&A. And we'll also talk a little bit more about the Be Bold Summit at the very end, um, along with the special discount that we have available for the next few days for all of you. Um, yeah. I think those are all the housekeeping items. Um, so Emma, please introduce yourself to, um, to everyone here and uh, we can get started. All right, well, hello everyone. Thank you for being here. Um, my name is um, Emma Goyen. I am um, an indigenous autistic person um, who's worked in the mental health field for the last 10 years or so. Um, I'm going to do like a, also like a quick image description of myself. Um, and I, so like I said, I'm an indigenous person. I have, um, long curly hair, um, that's tied up right now. I'm currently wearing some blue headphones. Um, I'm seated in my office. You can see like the, uh, couch behind me and some books on a shelf to my right. Um, and I, um, I'm wearing a black shirt in like a little cardigan <laughs> with some leopard print on it. Um, and so I am going to be talking today about some, uh, let's see if I can share the screen real quick. Uh, here we go. Yep. That is correct. Is that sharing correctly? Yeah, everybody can see it. Yeah. Right. Okay. Um. So, um, April is Autism Awareness Month. Um. <laughs> so this is kind of perfect timing, and I figured we could talk today a little bit about some myth busting, if you will, um, around different, uh, commonly held, let's say, uh, notions about autism, right, and autistic people. So. If it will pull it down. Yeah, there we go. All right, so to get started, I'm going to sort of ease into this conversation. Uh, the first myth we're going to be talking about is that person first language is preferred when we're discussing autism. Uh, so if you are familiar at all with uh, disability justice uh, activism and that sort of stuff, you will know that we actually. Uh, prefer to use, um, we, we prefer to be called autistic people, right? So we, we are disabled and disability isn't a bad word. Autism isn't a bad word. 
it's another identity for us. It's not something that we can stop being. Um, it is who we are. It is a neurotype as we think about it in the neurodiversity, um, uh, in the neurodiversity world, I guess you could say it that way. Um, and in the autistic community, of course, you will sometimes run into people who uh, prefer to say that you call that you say person with autism or um, maybe even on this person on the spectrum or something like that. But as a whole, you cannot go wrong um, by just talking about autistic people. Um, so it is used as an adjective. So just you know, a reminder, it's autistic people or autistic person, right? It's not um, the autistic, the, uh, yeah, so it's, it's an adjective. Um, but yeah, so this is the first sort of entry to the topic um, because um, this is one of the things that we talk a lot about with, within the autistic community, of course. Um, it's one, it's, you can usually tell um, when people have been taught certain uh, anti-autistic, ableist uh, ways of thinking. And so, um, the first way is, is the words, the words that we choose, right? The way that we choose to talk about autistic people, right? Um, when we say things like person with autism, right? And, or um, it's like carrying, am I carrying my autism? Like, am I like, or am I afflicted with, I've heard that one before, afflicted with autism, that sort of thing. And in the mental health world specifically, we are taught, right? To say like person with insert diagnosis, right? We are taught that way. Um, and so this is definitely like a, a shift in our language, um, but it, language matters. Um, and so, yeah. Um, yeah, so just remember, you know, autistic person. Um, so another <laughs> myth that we have um, is that there are milder, right? The example given is Asperger's syndrome, right? And more severe forms of autism. Again, this is something that we are taught in the mental health field, right? Especially if we were taught before the like newer new DSM and the changes in the uh, diagnostic criteria for autism, we are taught the functioning, right, functioning labels as these are called. Um, so we're taught that there's like a spectrum with like milder autism, like including like Asperger's over here. And then, you know, you go, you increase until you get to the severe forms of autism. Um, and so you'll hear a lot of people like they're severely autistic or something like that. So that's not correct, right? It's, it's all just autism. Um, there are severity levels within the DSM, uh, the diagnostic criteria. Uh, those are not the same as functioning labels anymore. Um, those uh, actually refer to what we call support needs. Um, so it's uh, what each autistic person there's their level of support need, right? So that is the severity level as it's called, sorry about that, as it's called um, in the DSM now. Um, and in part two, uh, this is because Asperger's has been removed, right, from the DSM. And a lot of people don't quite understand why that change happened. Um, or you'll have a lot of people, uh, you know, say, I, I was diagnosed as Asperger's, like, what am I now? Like, what is the diagnosis now? Like, or, or my child, you know, my, my teenager, my kid, my brother, um, my sibling, my, you know, um, and they don't understand. And, and, and as much as you, a lot of people are taught now, like, oh yeah, well, that's just autism now. Like, it's all one thing, which is correct. It's, it's all one thing. And the reason is um, that actually the the discovery let's say of autism goes back to uh the 1940s and the term the label asperger refers to the um one of the scientists who uh who um was we, we say as coining right like the the discovery of autism um it's always autism has always been there we just you know, didn't call it autism and didn't follow these specific, you know, diagnostic criteria. But um, 
And Asperger, it's actually an anti-Semitic thing um, because Hans Asperger was an Austrian scientist who uh, was working with the um, Nazi party at the time. And the entirety of the way that the diagnostic criteria was set up um, according to this functioning labels, right, is to determine a person's worth and a person and whether or not that person was able to function enough in society. Um, and so we we want to get rid of the functioning labels. We don't want to think about it that way anymore. We absolutely do not want to be using the term Asperger's anymore because you know we have um, a lot of Jewish folk in the community, and we that's just not something that we want to stand for. Um, and so we've moved away from using these terms and towards, like I said, support needs. Um, and then now we talk about, especially in the DSM, there's different levels of support needs. Um, and so you'll hear some people say, well, they're level one, they're level two, they're level three. And sort of like, what does that mean? And how is that not just, you know, milder or more severe, right? And so, um, it's actually talking about support needs and whether or not uh, an autistic person, let's say um, someone who is non-speaking might have like a higher support need level because they might need, let's say AAC or they might need, you know, some sort of uh, some needs, some accommodations or something to help in this specific trait of theirs um, as opposed to someone who like myself, for example, is speaking and so I might not need um, all like a, a, as let's say as many support needs right and so I you could potentially put classify that as like a lower support needs um, but just like a reminder too like it's not a binary right so it's not just it's it's a spectrum it's not just um, more severe or less severe it's not a binary of higher supports or lower supports um, support needs change um, so that's <laughs> just a general, very brief overview, um, things that some of you might already have heard actually. So, um, okay. So the next one is autism is a childhood diagnosis found mostly in boys. Um, so I think that this misconception <laughs> comes from the fact that, um, autism is seen as a neurodevelopmental disorder, right? And so, when we think neurodevelopmental disorders, we think, obviously it's in the word, right? Developmental. So we think of the development um, stages and, and especially with autism, you can, um, there's early intervention now, you know, from before 12 months, like you, you can already see the um, symptoms, right? The traits, the autistic traits in children. And so, um, it's really kind of believed to be, I guess, a childhood diagnosis, even though it's it's not, right? So when that autistic person, when that autistic child grows up, they, they don't just stop being autistic, right? You don't just, autistic adults exist, essentially, I guess is what I'm getting at here. Um, and in the same way too, as um, we have a lot of early interventions and this like, traits can be seen in um, as early as, right, like 12 to 24 months, right? Um, you can also miss those, right? Because it's a de developmental um, con condition, let's say. And so um, an autistic child might not, uh, the, their traits might not be as obvious, right, um, to the observer, which is how we diagnose autism. So to the observer, um, until they're much later, um, much older, right? So I myself, like I didn't speak until I was, I think around like four years old, um, something around there. And, um, but I also was multi like bilingual growing up. So uh, there was a little bit of that question of like, well, you know, um, are they just, you know, learning two languages at once and that belief uh, that, you know, learning more than one language can keep you from really developing um, the, the speaking portion, right? Um, and as is kind of a characteristic of autism too, like once I started talking, I was like using big words, like, <laughs> you know, like it just, I, I did not stop talking once I started. But um, 
So that too is just like, um, it comes from this idea, right? Of the childhood diagnosis is a little bit of like anti-autistic ableism, right? Like that fear too of like autism, right? And so when we get to like the transition period of autistic people's lives, right? Let's say, I don't know, like 21, right? That's that's kind of the, the age where insurance is like, oh, no more, like you're on your own. Um, and I know I, a lot of uh, kids, right? <laughs> Young adults get kicked off of the insurance when you reach about uh, like 21, 24, something like that. Um, with autism too, like that is one of those things that we have a lot, like I said, early intervention, childhood, right? Like in school, there's a lot of supports. And then you hit that transition and there's actually been some like statistics and research around the fact that there just isn't, and of course conducted by like folks within the autistic community, but um, there just isn't a lot of supports for that transition for autistic folks, right? From like uh, high school, let's say into like college, that sort of piece. And another factor too, that we sort of forget about autism is that um, it is something that you, one of the criteria talks to this, right? And it talks to the point that it's, it's until you are able to um, cope, let's say with like the social um, needs of a group. And so um, a lot of like, there are a lot of concepts that go into this, right? So in the autistic community, we talked about masking, um, and why, for example, uh, someone might learn to sort of like hide their autistic traits um, and thus, you know, they get missed like at an earlier age, we'll say. Um, and then, but they'll hit a certain period, a certain point in this developmental, because remember neurodevelopmental, it's developmental trajectory, right? Where the needs of like, what they need to be doing socially, right, is, is kind of too much, quote unquote. Um, and so that's when you really start to see like the autistic traits like develop or, or in certain people or develop in certain people. They've always been there. It's just that, you know. Um, and also, again, the second part of this is that it's found mostly in boys. Um, and that really just goes back to, as I was mentioning before, like the history of the diagnosis and the diagnostic criteria, right? And so um, in the 40s, right, it was developed as a way, as I said, to see who was functioning. And if you were able to function and benefit society, then they kind of gave you like this Asperger's like syndrome label. Um, and all of the criteria for that really, the, the, it was, it was based off of like, I, I think it's like a very small number of children that, um, Hans Asperger was studying and they were all white, cis, het, male, right? That was just, and so anything that was developed from that criteria really was sort of based around that, um, and so if you are not white, if you are not cis, if you are not straight, and if you are not male, um, chances are you did not get caught with this sort of uh, diagnostic criteria, right? That was available at the time um, before, you know, this like last sort of change. Um, and even even with this change, let's, let's be real. Um, <laughs> but, um, so there has been um, a lot of sort of this belief, right, that um, autism is being overdiagnosed. Um, and I really just kind of feel like, again, it comes back to this, right? So if we think of autism as a childhood diagnosis, that's mostly boys, then we're absolutely missing people, right? We're not diagnosing people, we're misdiagnosing people maybe even. And so when you adapt that criteria and you adapt your way of thinking about autism and about, um, you know, like your anti-autistic ableism, you at that point, right, can start to see where there are gonna be new, new diagnoses coming from, right? Um, so sort of just 
touched on that. And actually, perfectly going into this one, which is that um, only an official diagnosis of autism is valid. Um, so this one's tough. This one's tough because uh, I'm a mental health professional. We're we're in the mental health field, right? And so we want to be able to tell people, like, come to us and we will help you, you know, learn about your symptomology, learn about these traits of yours, right? Because for autism, we refer to them as traits. And we want to be able to help you. Um, we want to be able to give that diagnostic criteria and, and we're trained, right? We are trained to be able to diagnose. So we're trained to be able to look at that diagnostic criteria and say, yes, no, maybe so, right? Um, and so we want to be able to say, you know, you can't self-diagnose because that's, if it gets into a, a lot of issues, right? Like if you can self-diagnose, then I don't know, well, like, what's the point of the DSM? Like, what's the point of treaters? What is the, right? Like, what is the point of all these things? What is the point of a diagnostic process, right? Um, but the fact of the matter is, it's just, it's that self-diagnosis is valid, okay? The community absolutely embraces self-diagnosis. And there are so many reasons for this, right? So even if we think about, like, for example, the stages of change model, right? For a person to even come into therapy seeking, let's say, right, like a diagnosis, come into a neuropsych evaluation, right? They already have to be at a certain stage where they are thinking about the fact like that they might have these traits, that there might be something that is worth looking into. So already they've sort of self-diagnosed themselves, right? Like they, they were able to um, look at themselves and say, hey, you know, this may be going on and, you know, like, what is this, right? So it's, it's already, we're already kind of accepting the fact that self-diagnosis is a thing, right? Um, and if we want to look even at like uh, medical issues, right, let's say, um, because we really, mental health is sort of like a medical model, right? And so if you want to look at the medical, like medical issues as a comparison, you, let's say you'll look at your throat and you'll say, mm, okay, so I have this symptom, scratchy throat, right? I'm coughing. That's another symptom. I'm this, I'm that. And then you think, hey, I might have a cold or maybe this is the flu or maybe, you know, given the pandemic, right? This could be COVID. So how do I, how do I know? I need to go get tested. I need to go. But that's a self-diagnosis, right? We already sort of in our heads, like determined, right? Like, that it might be one of these, that it might be one of these diagnoses. And so it's really odd if we <laughs> then don't allow people to sort of diagnose themselves, right? Before walking into a mental health professional's office, right? Um, and so thinking about two of the other stuff that I was previously mentioning, right? Autism has really sort of been based off of white, cis, het, male folk, right? And so if we, again, think about all of those people um, that aren't being diagnosed, right? Because do is it really that the diagnostic criteria, like is autism really only found in white, cis, het men? Like, is that, is that really? No, right? Um, I know media might make us think that um, with the Sheldon Coopers of the world. Uh, but no, it's not found that way, right? And so we have to think about all of those people who might not have access, right, to um, even even to barriers of access, right? So the barrier to even have access to a mental health uh, professional, for example, right? Um, and so we can't just say like you you have like only those who are officially diagnosed are autistic. Um, and then even just, uh, like, that's not even mentioning, right, like, all of the issues around the diagnosis itself, right? So not everyone benefits from an official diagnosis. Um, their official diagnoses, right, like, carry a lot of stigma. Um, 
it's autism is a disability, right? It falls under the ADA. So on the one hand, yay. <laughs> on the other hand, you know, there's your legal sort of issues and, 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 and rights, right? Your legal rights will always kind of be in flux, right? Things like, for example, your right to bear arms, right? Um, or um, I don't know, there's so many, so many like issues around whether you even should get an official diagnosis, right? Um, and then too, right? So we talked about someone with the um, stages of, of change, right? So someone needs to think, hey, this might be an issue, right? And then needs to go find a, a, a mental health professional and all the barriers to that. But then also an official diagnosis, right? Like that's, we really in the mental health field rely on neuropsychological testing, right? And that is expensive. Um, it's, it's time consuming. Um, and then we go back to that other slide where I was talking about too, how it's really focused for on children, right? And so usually you might get a diagnosis in, through the school systems, you might, right? But, but what about that autistic adult, right? What about that person who, you know, was able to fall through the gaps, right? And didn't get a diagnosis in school, right? So what happens with them? Like, are they, right? Because, and, and when we look at too, even the assessment tools that we have, they're geared <laughs> towards kids. Like we, that part of the assessment tools, right? Is like, you ask parents, you ask the teachers for the evaluation about, uh, like, um, about the individual, right? And so with that, um, you, you just sort of, um, you already, I guess, let's say, um, have, have issues, right? Like it's the access, it's the barriers, it's the, um, yeah, it's the barriers. Sorry, I just got a little distracted by Zoom. <laughs> um, <laughs> look at me getting distracted, it's fine. Okay, so yeah, so it's, it's the barriers of like, right, a neuropsychological uh, test. Um, and how you, how you even can access those. Okay, I skipped a slide. Let me go back. There we go. All right. Autistic people like theory of mind. Okay, I need to get ready for this one because um, this is a uh, big one. Um, I want us all to think back about when we were taught about autism in school, okay? One, I, one of the big hallmarks, right, of autism that we're taught is that autistic people lack theory of mind, right? And so we are taught that, um, I, I'm, I'm, I remember watching, right, in my psych psych 101 class I remember watching a video um where they did that that uh the uh experiment let's say right where it's like the the kid and the two little dolls right and you put one doll in one room and then um that doll like walks I don't know if it's like a marble or something and hides it right and um we'll call that doll Sally right and then Sally weaves and then in comes another doll and, and she takes the marble um, that's hidden, I don't know, under a blanket somewhere because um, she saw she saw Sally hide it and then hides it in a box, right, and walks out. And then Sally, the doll Sally, comes back in and asks the child, like, hey, you know, and, 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 then, and then the research will ask the child, right, hey, where, where, where do you think Sally is going to look for them, for the marble? Like, where do you think it's hidden? And the child would say, autistic child would say, oh yeah, it's in the box, right? Um, and that was sort of the experiment, right? That was like conducted. And I remember that's how we were taught. There was videos, right? And then, and then we're, and then I remember like my teacher like finishes showing the video and turns around and is like, all right, so this is like the theory of mind, right? And goes on to talk about how like autistic people don't have that, right? Like the autistic people can't they'll look at they'll, they'll answer the wrong thing right and it's they it's 
this idea, this concept of theory of mind isn't just that individual autistic person, right? But universally, right? Universally, all autistic people will get this wrong. So theory of mind <laughs> comes from someone called Simon Baron Cohen. Um, hopefully some of you recognize the name. Um, it is so widely claimed <laughs> in the last 30 years or so since this has like been discovered or coined, let's say, by um, Simon Baron Cohen, people will reproduce this, this idea. They will go, um, every time you see research, right, it's always quoting that one, that one idea. But empirically speaking, <laughs> it's just, it's not there. We don't have anybody... I mean, we do have people challenging it. It's just it, nobody was listening to, to what was being challenged, right? But it's we like if you look at all our textbooks, right? You'll you'll have people like touting theory of mind, like as if this is the <laughs> the I don't know, one factor, I guess, of autism, right? That. I, and I just, cause there's not that there was like one and one study that like he did. And, um, actually he, act, he even came out and tried to, to like rectify that and to say, you know, that, uh, it's not all autistics or something like that. And it's just, but people just keep using that. It's, it's every research article that you'll find on theory of minds, every, um, book, et cetera. Um, and so, and we really, right, we're taught that it's, it's, we lack theory of mind. And so it's, it also, it, 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 excuse me, it also did not take into account um, that autistic people aren't the only people who might fail um, these theory of mind tasks, right? Um, there, there's plenty of evidence that uh, the, there are other folks um, that are not typical, right? So not a, a listic is the term that we use for anybody who is not autistic. So not just a listic, but um, who are, who diverge from like the typical neurotype, right? And so um, like kids with, let's say Down syndrome, cerebral palsy, right? Um, even kids who uh, were exposed to um, in utero, right, to mothers who smoke, mothers who drink, like in utero, right, all of these kids who could, who are, who could be autistic, right, all of them also, like, fail, quote, unquote, like, these, this, the theory of mind tasks, um, lower, kids with lower SES, um, socioeconomic status, right, uh, kids who have less siblings, um, kids who are blind, kids who are deaf or hard of eating, hard of hearing, all of these um, also like within research have failed uh, the false belief task or the theory of mind tasks, right? And so, but it really has only stuck with autism. And that honestly is just anti-autistic ableism. It's the fear of autism um, that has been ingrained in society, right? Um, yeah. So along with that comes the idea that autistic people lack social awareness, um, which <laughs> um, I think I think this comes from the diagnostic idea, right? Because it's a social, like, uh, we'll say like a social disability. Um, but this also goes back to the theory of mind, right? And to the idea that uh, autistic people, it's, it's inherently and universally within the autistic person that the, that, that those issues lie. And, um, so it wasn't until 2012 that, uh, Damian Milton, um, coined what's called a double empathy problem. Um, and it just like the long and short of it is just that, excuse me, um, Yes, there is sort of a disconnect when you put autistic people with a listic, remember non-autistic people. However, 
when you have holistics communicating together and then separately when you have autistics communicating together there seems to be less there is less not just things there is less issues with communication and so the communication is actually when you put an autistic person with an holistic person and the double entity problem really is sort of challenging that idea of theory of a mind right that says that it's because the autistic person is at fault and actually it's because you know it, it proposes i guess that in actuality it's that we just have different forms of let's say of communication and so there's like that disconnect between you know um when when we try to communicate with each other and there have been lots of studies that sort of back that up uh more recently right because i said 2012, 2012 that was 10 years ago but it's still pretty recent right in the mental health fields um and so yeah um I do have more slides, but I'm wondering, Roman, should we pause for some Q&A? Yeah, let's pause for some Q&A. And also we're pretty close to our time box. Yeah. Um, so we'll um, we'll be able to address some questions and then kind of go. There was one in the chat. There was a question mm -hmm. somebody asked about self-diagnosis. Okay. And um, so the question is, self-diagnosis could be entirely wrong. Sneezing is a mm -hmm. symptom, not a diagnosis. Mm -hmm. People could self-misdiagnose without training and then never mm -hmm. actually get treatment for what they actually have. Will you please mm -hmm. clarify? Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so yeah, self-diagnosis could be wrong, right? But let's let's start from there. Let's say somebody uh, er erroneously, right, labels themselves autistic. Well, let's first start from the fact that a person even has to consider autism <laughs> with the sheer anti-autistic ableism and fear of autism that exists in commu in our community, right? Like we know in the mental health field, autism is a very loaded diagnosis, right? It is not a label, like we really defer to people who do neuropsych testing, right? Um, and we like, it's just, it's, we are very scared almost to label anyone autistic, right? Because we know, we know the stigma that that diagnosis carries. And so, for the, a person to even consider, right, like that they might be autistic is huge, right? The process of unlearning all of that internalized ableism um, to even see the autistic traits in themselves, right? So that in itself is already like a huge, if someone's considering autism, you know, what is the harm? What is the harm in looking at that with them right like is it because we're afraid that they're going to like is it like a scarcity mentality of they're not going to have enough like, they're going to use up supports that aren't theirs okay but first of all if it's an autistic adult there really isn't there aren't supports there just aren't um so that's like not an issue um so yeah so i just kind of would pose back like so what <laughs> So what? So what if the self-diagnosis is wrong? Um, we we can diagnose ourselves incorrectly with things like, of course, like medication and stuff like that. But to even get to that point, you're going to, you know, need to to overcome so much, right? And and medications just aren't effective for autism. That's another thing. There are not there are no medications that work. Um, quote unquote, uh, for autism. So that's, it's not even like a concern. Um, yeah. So the training, right. Really comes from like that. That's that idea that I was mentioning that we have, like, we've got the training for this, but how many of us really have the training even for autism? Like, do you, we, like I just said, we defer to neuropsych testing and, and neuropsych testing in itself is not even super accurate. Like I, that is a whole other subject. Um, but, um, you know, so if we're not even trained and we're the ones who are supposed to be like, like experts, right, quote unquote, on autism, then, and we can get it wrong, right? Like, why not somebody, a person knows themselves best, right? Mm -hmm. And part two of like autism, like I was saying, is like the masking and the um, social functioning up until 
it's too much that's required. And so it could just be that like from the outside looking in, because that's how we, that's how we diagnose autism, right? Is like this, it's an observer's point of view. Like I mentioned, it's the teachers, the uh, parents and what they observe in the, in the child and not what the like person is feeling and thinking. Um, and so if we can just learn about autism and the autistic traits and explore that with people, right, then we can help people, we can help people with that self-diagnosis or self-diagnosis, right? Yeah, I think um, I love how you explain that because, you know, there's, that is something that a lot of um, professionals, mental health professionals, medical professionals, um, um, worry about. And I, and I, mm-hmm. I hold the belief that we're worried because we care. And, yes. um, yes. also, um, what I have learned, I'm not autistic. However, I am neurodivergent. I have lots of neurodivergent autistic folks in my life. And I, what I've learned from them and what I continue to learn is that most people who are self-diagnosis, self-diagnosing in later teen years, early adulthood, midlife and beyond, most people that I've come across are doing a lot of learning and research and asking all kinds of questions. So they're not logging into miautistic.com, you know, written by a bot or, you know, whatever. And like, oh, that's me. Um, So something I've learned is that, you know, folks who have that that feeling, that sense that, you know, so I've, I've learned these 10 things and they really connect. I've learned that they really do a lot of research yes. on all the sides. So a lot of autistic folks that I know that self-diagnosed either first, or that's all they stuck with was a self-diagnosis. They know more than most professionals yes. I've ever talked to. And so they can you know, like it's, it's really, really important to remember that people aren't going out there reading one piece of information and saying, Oh, that's me. I'm not saying no one has ever done that, but the vast majority of autistic folks who have self-diagnosed do not come into a professional's office without weeks and weeks of, you know, re, um, information gathering and finding. And if they do, right, it might be that they don't know how to access more information because maybe they are living in a community without that access. Maybe they are belonging to a family that is really restrictive of their access to information. I mean, there's so many reasons why folks might not have access to more of that information. But from what I've learned and even myself um, um, in my own process is that it's rarely ever a a careless effort. (laughs) Um, and, uh, I myself never, as a, when I was doing my master's program in mental health, I never was trained anything on autism and how to diagnose and what to do. And, you know, what does this mean? Nothing. I mean, maybe like a paragraph, maybe a chapter, but we didn't focus on it at all. And so there's a lot of, and I know there's a lot of other mental health professionals that have no clue based on like our schooling, we have to seek it out afterwards. And um, I think it's, Emma, you already said this, it's important to know and remember that our mental health um, conceptualization of mental health and what's, what has been deemed as quote, normal or healthy development is founded on, has a foundation, um, a very narrow scope of how an adult person or a child person is supposed to perform in the world. And um, often those beliefs and then the modalities that are built upon those beliefs are very, very harmful for folks in all kinds of different um, community settings, all types of different lived experiences, identities, and cultures. So it's important to, just as, as a lot of us are reckoning with the racism that is inherent in mental health. We are also reckoning with what does this mean for the people that we have labeled the most extreme, right? Um, The diagnoses that are most extreme, I'm quoting air quotes, scary, 
um, untreatable, like all of these things, right? Um, and so autism, Emma, like you said, is one of those that people are really fearful of. Um, we have a lot of images from the media, um, maybe someone in our community growing up, right? Like maybe we saw one person, they were highly stigmatized and you know, we were taught to fear autism first. We weren't taught to be curious about autistic people and their role in society and how, you know, we weren't taught to be curious at all. Um, and so I think that's really important that a lot of that is most often at play when we're fearful of self-diagnosis as professionals. It's not just like on the surface, we want people to get the care they need, but under that surface, there's a lot under there, a lot of implicit bias. And so I'm speaking very directly to this from my own experience and the folks I work with that there is that under that surface. So whether or not you're aware of it now, just know that it's there. We all have that because it's how we've been taught and trained as clinicians, unless we intentionally sought out a different way of learning about autistic people. Um, and it's back to like the like origins of autism, right? And the history, let's say, of like how autism has been viewed in society. Again, back to the like functioning labels, right? Like folks who are autistic were, were the less functioning members of society. So it was created, it's almost like an oppress, oppressive category, right? Like it, a category of oppression, right? Like, and so it comes from that too. And um, just to like sort of highlight to what you were saying about the like folks who, who self-diagnose will have, <laughs> will have done a lot of research. Um, I think that one thing that we all know about autism is like the amount of information, right? That like autistic people will have for what, what we deem our special interests. And as you know, obviously you could see, I can like what we call info dump, like talk about this for hours because like it is so near and dear to my heart and it is a special interest of mine, right? As an autistic person. Um, but yes, right on the money, like someone, and that could also even be, help you sort of think, hey, maybe we should, <laughs> this person's coming in and they've got like a, you know, thing, a book full of like highlighted research articles and, and, you know, maybe, maybe we might want to consider that. And even in the community, like it's one thing that we talk about, um, folks who are diagnosed later in life, um, or who are self-diagnosed tend to really take um, autism as a special interest. So absolutely, they will know. They will know more than you will know. I, yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yep, yep. All right, so we have several really important questions yes. in the chat um, yes. and we do not have time to get to them. So um, I am going to, this, the chat will already be saved on my end. Emma, I'm going to send the questions to you okay. as you have time and capacity, if it's something you would like to do, um, if you could answer those questions absolutely, whenever, um, and then we will make sure to get those answers out if you're able to, to answer those questions. Um, I will say that um, if you all are on Instagram, there are some fabulous um, Instagram accounts. Um, just search, search the hashtag actually autistic. Um, typing that in the chat, search that hashtag anywhere. That's a really good one to start with. Um, and I think between, you know, um, Emma, myself, some other folks, um, we're connected with, you know, we could probably send out an email with some other, um, accounts and resources. Also, Emma will be presenting at our Be Bold Summit this June 10th and 11th. So you can participate in Emma's session that way. Um, and I will send out a link to everybody to um, who registered today, who was either here live or watching the replay that will contain an extra discount for the Be Bold Summit. Right now, the registration cost is $397. That is the early bird price that will increase um, on May 1st. So if you were to register in the next three days using um, the link I will send out, um, you will get an additional um, discount. So it'll be $317 um, for the next few days. So you'll get that in your email and I will post... Um, there's, oops, 
Zoom always gets me when someone sends me a direct message and then I message the whole chat and it only goes to one person. Okay, so uh, beabledsummit.com forward slash Emma. That's where you can learn more about the summit. Um, feel free to send us any questions that you have. Um, and let me just make sure there's nothing real quick in the chat. I will say I did take a peek at some of the questions and I do address some of these um, and what I plan to speak on at the summit. So I, I can definitely answer these, but they will, I will definitely be going over some of these in more detail and a lot of what I spoke about today too, in more detail. So. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. All right. Um, I think that's it, Emma. Thank you so much for being yeah. with us today and sharing all of the information it was you, your point of view, your perspectives, your presence is so valued and important to us. And so I'm really glad that you were able to um, do this webinar for us. Um, yeah, so I guess we will we'll see you in June at the yeah. summit. Um, <laughs> and we hope all of you who are watching this will be able to join us as well in some capacity. Um, and yeah, so, all right. Oh, there's a quick question about the summit rates. So um, uh, for the Beeble Summit, we do have, um, well, through every program at Scaling Up, we have scholarship programs, partial scholarship programs um, available. So all you have to do is hop on over to our website um, and there is um, on our about us, you'll see an accessibility plan and you can, or accessibility, yeah, accessibility plan. And there's links to the different scholarships. We don't really have criteria. It's just, if you submit an application, um, you'll get a partial, partial scholarship um, and it's just a matter of time. So sometimes um, the, we have a longer wait list than other times. Um, so yeah, we, we do have that available. Um, what else? I think that's it. So if anyone has any questions, feel free to send them directly to us. I'm typing in the chat, info at scalingupemdr.com and we'll see you all later. Thank you so much.